the shooting range. In this episode, pages of history, combat helicopter for the Marines, squad mates conquering the new map, and metal beasts, German double barrel rocket launcher. Two years ago, the Metal Beasts featured the Swedish USH-405. It's been unique for quite a while, but that's about to change. Today, we'd like to introduce its sibling in arms, the German Raketenautomat. Don't be confused by its silly looks. It's actually the most dangerous member of the Stag Beetle family. Its main caliber is a twin 81mm grenade launcher with elevation angles between minus 10 and plus 20 degrees. The mechanized ammo racks store 18 grenades, with additional ones found in the center of the hull. The engine and transmission compartment is in the rear, while the three crew members are in the front. Similar to the Swedish vehicle, the best part about this one is the weaponry. The Raketenautomat can shoot high explosive grenades with a penetration rate of 330 millimeters. No tank at this battle rating can catch such a pitch. Each of the launchers can send a grenade at the enemy every point five seconds. In the game, that means that if you catch someone in your sights and they fail to shoot first, you win. Still, we'd like to warn you against getting trigger happy. Spraying your enemy with grenades is impressive, sure, but your ammo pool might vanish before you can say zip. Admittedly, it's not as big of a problem for this vehicle compared to the Swedish one, since it can always reload using additional grenades from stowage but it's still very much possible to waste them all, so you'd better stay ammo-savvy. Now, the mobility of the Raketen Automat is far from impressive. We wouldn't call it slow, but it's clearly not fast enough for flanking. And that's what defines the tactics for this vehicle. We recommend you stick to the classic SPG tactic. Attack from positions behind your allies' backs or from places that hide your hull. By the way, the design of this vehicle is pretty friendly to such moves. The rocket launcher's in the front, so you can fire at the enemy without exposing your hull that much. As a bonus, the depression angle reaches 10 degrees, so you can use the landscape to your advantage. By the way, we'd also like to suggest binding separate keys for firing the left and right launchers. It might be of great use when you turn a corner in urban combat. This new German machine offers a great handy design and an impressive level of firepower. We hope it'll bring you some enjoyable experiences and numerous victories. Not so long ago, we told you the story of how the Apache came to be. Remember the drama the American military had about its creation? Some claimed they needed to make a new combat helicopter from scratch, instead of trying to make do in half a year using an existing machine. Others believed they didn't need a combat helicopter at all, and could instead upgrade the Cobra to fit the requirements. Now, the most influential member of that other group was the US Marine Corps. Both the military heads and the top managers of stakeholder companies tried their best to convince the Marines, pushing one argument after another, but ended up defeated. The Marines refused to abandon either the Cobra or its sibling, the Huey. Why? Well, there were multiple reasons. One, the Cobra was a completely familiar and basically native chopper by the late 1970s. It had been thoroughly tested in Vietnam and the pilots knew every quirk it had. The ground staff also got to know both the Cobra and the Huey really well. The long and extensive usage of these machines in an actual war helped it shut off the last teething issues it had. Two, the Marine Cobras and Hueys were based on ships and special air bases and required special parts, consumables, and fuel logistics, which had all been practiced to perfection in major operations. Just a reminder, naval deployment is an entire science that ground-based air forces never even have to think about. Meanwhile, the Cobra had long solved all those issues by that time. After all, there was a reason for making the special Sea Cobra modification. And finally, reason number three. So, here's the promising anti-tank missile, the Hellfire. Who said the Cobra couldn't get the hardpoints and the fire control system for those? 
You know, it's way cheaper to upgrade an existing heli to use them, instead of making a new one, especially since the former is almost just as good. So what was the outcome? Well, there was this official statement that the US Marine Corps' application for the new AH-64 was denied. Still, they didn't have to walk away empty-handed. In 1983, the Bell Company introduced the AH-1W Super Cobra. A bit later, they also announced a deep upgrade, the AH-1Z, with new four-blade main and tail rotors. That machine looked like it could do anything, meaning it could do everything the Apache could, and then some more. By the way, it's important to know that Bell developed the Viper on its own initiative and using its own funds. Oh, they knew it would be a wise investment. Additionally, the Super Cobra could also be modernized in a factory environment to match the Viper's level. Well, that does it. Everybody's happy. The Marines got what they wanted, fed their feeling of uniqueness and elitism, and reinforced their fame as the troublemakers. Bell kept its order numbers up. The competition got some Apaches to make for the army. Now, how about that endless dispute about which heli's better? A Transport Huey remake or a brand new design? Nah, forget it. Let anyone who wants to argue keep doing so. We've already made the welcome tour around the new map, and many players must have had the chance to try it for themselves. So now we'd like to give you a few tactical ideas that might help you and your squad mate lead your entire team to victory on this map. Get the ignition, we're going to the Iberian Castle. The landscape and roads on this map are pretty symmetrical, so our recommendations stay true for both teams. In scenario one, the squad spawns in the southern point and heads inside the castle. One player should move towards point C, while the other one should follow the outer edge of the wall towards square E. This way, you can organize crossfire at any enemy attacking the western part of the map. Once the inner yard of the castle is clear, the first player can capture point C. The other one doesn't need to wait around. It's better if they change position. Move to the center of E4 if you're on the northern team, and D3 if you're on the southern one. This place gives you good firing angles at both the castle and the outer streets of the town. Meanwhile, once the capture is done, that player can drive towards the wall and get ready to meet the second wave of attackers. Just remember to exchange intel on enemy movements on time so that you're ready for your next target. If your allies fail to handle the second capture area, guess who needs to do it? Right, your squad. And of course, you need to attack the closest point. No use in driving across the entire map here. Now, point B is better capped by the player who took C. They can safely move to the center while their squad mate distracts the incoming enemy reinforcements. Once the point is taken, all you need to do to establish dominance is find a good position near point B so that you don't miss a random wanderer from town. Now, scenario two implies obtaining control over the map's center first. The squad mates should spawn at different points and move in parallel until one of them is right next to B and the other one is nearby, a couple blocks away at worst. Should one of the players meet resistance, the other one should be able to help them on time. Chances are the enemy will be so consumed by the fight that they won't be able to realize they're being flanked or react to the new threat. Once this direction is clear, finish your cap and act according to the situation. Your allies were successful in attacking the other one and got the second point? Great! You can now switch to defense positions. E4 and E5 for the northern team, or D3 and C3 for the southern one. These are great places for reducing incoming firepower and preventing the enemy from getting close to the center. If your allies couldn't bring any good news, it's time to attack the castle point. The attack might follow the first scenario, just in the opposite direction. One of the players should follow the closest route to the capture area, while the other one should follow the wall to the enemy side. A strike to the rear would be a nasty surprise for the enemy, making the liberation of the castle considerably easier. As always, there's room for experimentation. Adjust the tips we give to your play style or the situation at hand. With more experience, you'll be able to make new plans on the go and implement them just as quickly. Just remember, the key to success is timely data exchange between you and your teammates. 
And now, it's time for us to answer some of your questions. The first question was sent by a player called Renault Clio 5. What's the difference between the F16A and the A16ADF? Hi there. The ADF is a pure fighter that can't carry any assault weaponry. The F16A, on the other hand, cannot use medium range radar guided missiles. Gilbert James Salute asks What's the most powerful 20mm cannon shell? Meningishos, if I pronounced it correctly, or Hispano. Hi, Gilbert. You're right. The Meningishos are the most powerful 20mm HE rounds. By the way, we talked about mid-tier 20mm autocannons in our last episode. Check it out if you want to know more. Another question comes from Kleine Panza. Could you do a comparison between the ground-based man pads in the game? The Stinger, the Type 91, the HN6, the Mistral? Hi there, little tank. Thanks for the idea. We do have a comparison of guided missiles in our plans, including some SAMs. See them in one of the next round studies. One Star 1265 writes, Are you planning on doing a triathlon for fourth generation jets? Hey, Star! Of course! The Top Fighter Triathlon will be updated, sooner or later. We just want to add some spice to the testing, so we're waiting for the game to get a few more great machines. And the last comment for today was written by Sir Pufferfish. Will jets such as the Eurofighter Typhoon, FA-18 Hornet, and F-15 Eagle be eventually added to War Thunder? Greetings, Sir Pufferfish. As we've mentioned multiple times before, War Thunder can add any vehicle that exists in real life and can find a purpose in the game. What we can't say, though, is when it might happen. You know, it's just so satisfying when we can finally deliver something you've been waiting for. That's it for today. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment, and the next episode will premiere the following Sunday at 4 p.m. GMT or noon Eastern Time. Subscribe and click the bell if you don't want to miss our next videos. Don't forget to simplify your controls, leave a like, share your thoughts and comments, and see you next week.